as a texture or an environment artist, there are a range of material types that you're going to be making on a regular basis. One of those categories can most certainly be wood. Whether it's for chairs, tables, wooden flooring, paneling, you've got beams in the ceiling, or even outdoor applications like fencing or chopped firewood, things like that. The point is, it's definitely going to come up. So I thought, why not make a tutorial that begins to cover the fundamentals of creating wood patterns in Substance Designer? Today we're going to make this paneled wood texture, which could be used in a variety of applications like wooden flooring or even furniture, like a wooden chair or a dinner table. We'll talk about how to create that distinguished, swirly, knotted pattern, and also how to layer up extra detail for that extra touch. I've also started doing something new with these tutorials. If you'd like to follow along with a fully completed graph in Substance Designer, you can download this graph file from my new Gumroad page. You can then open it up, tinker with all the values, and see what everything does. The link is in the description down below. I'm excited, so let's get started. Okay, let's start off in Substance Designer by creating a new substance. I'm gonna choose the PBR Metallic Roughness template, and under the graph name, Old Wooden Flooring. That's pretty much what we're going to be making today. Uh, size mode absolute, we're going to make it 2K and then set it to 16 bits per channel. And hit OK. So right at the beginning, the template gives us all of these output maps and something to fill them in with. So everything's pretty much set up, but we'll get to some graph and viewport setup in a minute. First thing I want to do is grab a tile sampler. So spacebar, tile sampler. And I'm going to adjust these properties a little bit. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the X and Y amount. That's how many tiles we have here. So I'm going to choose somewhere around eight for the X and maybe a little bit less for the Y. Let's go with four. Yeah, four looks good. I'm going to change the pattern to paraboloid. So under the size parameters, I'm going to change the X and I'm going to basically decrease it so that we can squeeze in these circular shapes. I'm gonna choose something around, let's say 0.39, that looks good. And then what I'm gonna do is scroll down a bit more and increase the scale. So let's do something like right about here. Now if we go down a little bit more, we're gonna to go to the position random and we're really gonna strew these about. So it really doesn't matter like how much you randomize these, but really you just want a good sort of organic distribution of these circles. And if you want, you can play with the offset too. That also manipulates it just a little bit. Finally, what you want to do is scroll down to the bottom here and go to where it says color random. And let's add a little bit of variation to the grayscale or luminance values of these circles. So 0.71 is fine here. So this actually is the basis of our wood. And so what we're gonna do is with these shapes, we can bend and warp these lines around them to get this desired not warping effect. So to enhance this just a little bit more, after the tile sampler, let's add a blur high quality grayscale. So this just softens the tile sampler just a bit. And if I go to the intensity, we can blur it more or less. I'm gonna go for a bit more, something around pretty close to the end of the slider here. And so because we're blending this together, it gives us a bit more of an organic shape that we're gonna to use to warp and change the direction of these lines. So let's add those lines now. So let's make some room, hit spacebar, and choose anisotropic noise. So because we made these circles kind of squeezed in the vertical manner, we could do the same thing with our noise. So if we double click our anisotropic noise and we go over to the properties and you can see there's a rotate property, change that to true, so now it's up and down. And let's, let's adjust these properties a bit further. So you can see with this noise, we have an X and Y amount. Because we rotated this noise, the X amount actually adjusts the vertical noise aspect. So really what we want is to set this to one, and then we'll change the Y amount to how, pretty much how much detail you'd like to have in your knots, in the lines that define the wood. So I'm gonna choose something around the line, not too detailed, I'm gonna choose something like this. This is what I'm going for. And you can adjust the smooth interpolation. I'm just gonna bring the smoothness and the smooth interpolation all the way up so we get something clean and put together like that. So now you're probably wondering how we're going to create the overall warped shape. If I get a warp node, so here's our warp node, and it has two inputs here. So I'm gonna put the 
anisotropic noise in the input. And then I'm going to warp this noise with my blur high quality grayscale. So let's put that into the gradient input. And you can start to see what's happening here. Let me make some room. So if I double click on the warp and I can adjust the intensity, you can see that the lines are being warped by this pattern that we've created. So what's interesting is with Substance Designer, with most parameters, you don't have to just stick with the zero to one slider or the range that it gives you. You can actually go further than that. So I'm gonna choose, let's say if I choose something like five, now you can really see that pattern coming into shape. And I can show you the evolution of how that happens from straight lines and starts warping it around. And there is where we get our knots. And you can go crazy and create really tight knots like this, or you can relax it a bit. I'm gonna go somewhere around here. And that seems to be pretty good. Now let's take a look at what's going on in our 3D viewport. Now to get this going, there's a little bit of setup that we have to do. So one way that I like to do this is if I hit spacebar and add a blend, and I'm gonna connect our warp here to the foreground of this blend. And this blend is now gonna be piped into our outputs, which then get connected to our 3D view here, and also get imported into our texture image files later. So first up, I'm going to take the blend and drag it into this normal conversion node, which then goes into the normal output. And let's rotate our view a little bit. I'm just left clicking to orbit around, middle clicking the pan. You can use the scroll wheel to zoom. And I'm hitting control shift and right clicking to change the environment lighting so I can sort of see that detail that I'm looking for. So the normal added that. I'm going to then go down to where the ambient occlusion area is, and I'm gonna get rid of this uniform color placeholder, and I'm going to add an ambient occlusion node. And this takes this grayscale height information and adds our ambient occlusion shadows. So let's pump this conversion node into our output for ambient occlusion, and then take our blend here and drag that in. And immediately you can see what it's doing here. It's giving us those shadows and supplying more depth to our material. So that's looking good there. And then finally, what I wanna do is go down to the height output and remove this uniform color and then put our blend into the height. Now you're not gonna see much change in the height and that's because we need to go to our 3D view and go to materials, default, then the physically metallic roughness and choose. I use tessellation in this case. That's gonna let you access these properties over here. And I'm gonna up the tessellation factor. And then when you change this scale value, look in the 3D viewport, you can see in our view, we're adding height to our mesh. Now that's pretty cool, uh, but we're gonna go for something a bit more laid back. In fact, you really don't need that much height or even tessellation for this material. But I like to add some because you get some real displacement going on and that adds a bit more realism to when we're looking at our view. So if I zoom in here, and rotate the light a bit. Now you can start to see we're getting some real height from these knots. And so now we have this basic setup here. So we've got our tile sampler that creates our base shape. We blur it and we're warping these lines from this anisotropic noise and we're piping it into our outputs. So let's refine these knots just a little bit more and give ourselves some creative control. So let's make some room. I'm gonna separate our knots nodes from our final blend. So actually I'm gonna right click on this and add a comment and I'm gonna say final blend because we're gonna be creating a bunch of blends and this just makes it easy to keep track of what's going on. So keeping our final blend over there, let's bring this stuff over. And after our warp here, I'm gonna select the warp, hit spacebar and add a histogram scan. Now histogram scan node is kind of like a levels node and a contrast and brightness node. Basically, it goes through the histogram, you can choose a position, and it lets you pick and choose which values you'd like to include. So with the histogram scan node, you can isolate how many levels of knots you'd like for this particular material. So if we zoom in and you look and see, we've got some blank spaces here. If we bring up the position, you can add more or less levels of depth. So if I bring this down, you can see we have a shallower amount of knots and less depth. And you can really control if you wanna make this more of a stylized thing or more realistic. And you can add more knots by adding more uh, Y amount to our anisotropic noise. We're gonna keep it where it is now. And so I'm just gonna isolate where we want this position to be. For now, I think I'm gonna pick something like 0.41. 
So we get something more like this. And if you'd like, if you think that the ambient occlusion and the shadows are a bit too much here, you can go over to your ambient occlusion conversion node here and you can change the height depth. You can bring it down or bring it up. I'm gonna keep it relatively low for now and then maybe increase it later. So back to this histogram scan, you can see I've chosen this amount of depth and knots in our texture. So right now, as I'm looking at our material, these knots look very clean. And if you look at the knots in wood that's cut there, it's a bit more choppy. So let's do that now. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click out my graph, hit spacebar, and get a clouds one. I'm gonna keep this as it is and keep it default. I'm gonna click on it, hit spacebar, and then add another histogram scan. And what I wanna do is kind of sharpen up this clouds noise. And so with that histogram scan, I'm just gonna bring up the position. You can see what it's doing there. And we can also adjust the contrast of this histogram scan. And that gives us a bit more harsh and a sharper result here. So I can go through the position. You can see I'm getting more or less from this clouds one noise. So I'm gonna give this just a little bit of contrast, maybe 0.24. And then I'm just gonna slide through here and pick, pick what I'm looking for as my result. And I'm thinking somewhere around point, yeah, 0.57 is good. Because now what we're gonna do is use this noise to warp our knots even further. So to do that, I'm gonna click on my graph, hit space bar, and add a directional warp node. So this directional warp node takes two inputs. The first input is input. We're gonna put in our histogram scan that has our knots in it as the input. This is what we're going to warp. And then the intensity input is by how much we're going to be warping this input by. So let's put our histogram scan into the intensity input, double click on it, and you can see what's happening here. It's gone all crazy. And the reason why it looks weird like that is because our warp angle is moving to the left here. So you can change which direction the warp angle is going. And if you hold shift, it'll snap to these angles here. So I'm actually gonna choose up and down or negative 90 in the degrees here. And we can adjust the intensity to how rough we want these edges to be. I'm gonna go for a less is more approach here and do right around 4.5, something like 4.56 here. And you can see if I zoom in, we're adding that extra bit of roughness. So if I click here, this is what it looked like before. Double click here on the directional warp. That's what we're adding. So we took this clouds noise and we sharpened it up a little bit with the histogram scan and then used it as the intensity input for our directional warp to get this. So now that we've done that, let's continue to make a little bit more room. I'm going to drag this over. And now if I put this directional warp in as the foreground of our final blend here, you can see we're getting a more organic, rough shape to our knots. So I'm just gonna rearrange this a tiny bit. And now thinking ahead, I know that I wanna work with these knots quite a bit. In fact, I'm thinking about you know later when I'm gonna add color and when I'm gonna add even more detail and I kind of wanna isolate these knots from other things. And to do that, I'm actually gonna make a mask so that I can easily decide what happens to these knots and what happens around them. So I'm actually gonna to go to my histogram scan here not the directional warp. And I'm gonna go and drag out a connection from that histogram scan to add another histogram scan. And I use histogram scans all the time to create masks. So if we double click this new histogram scan and I crank the contrast all the way up, now I can choose where I wanna mask off these particular knots. I could choose how many knots I'm selecting, which lines I'm selecting, and you could just drag this slider and it's really useful. You can dial it in and choose exactly what you'd like to get in this mask. I'm gonna choose something like 0.57 there. And after this new histogram scan, I'm gonna drag out and add a levels node. Now the levels node is what we're gonna use in the future, but I have it here just for now as a placeholder. This, this really helps increase or decrease the intensity of your mask in a way. And I'll show you how to do that a little bit later when we take advantage of this levels node. But as for now, just keep it here and we're gonna use it later. So this group of nodes is what's creating our knots. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all of them, hit spacebar, type in, frame. I'm going to frame them up and this sort of compartmentalizes your nodes so you can easily organize and look through your graph. So I'm going to call this knots. Now let's continue adding some more detail. So I'm going to take this group and just slide it back again. I'm going to click out my graph and I'm going to add 
a new blend node. And I'm going to set this blend to subtract. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go all the way back to the blur high quality grayscale. And I'm going to left click and drag another connection out from there. And while I'm holding left click and dragging, I can middle mouse click and pan, scroll into zoom. And I'm actually going to put this in the background of this blend. Then what I'm going to subtract from this shape is the directional warp with our knots in it. So if I drag this out and put this in the foreground, this is what we're getting. You can see that right where the main highlights of that blurred high quality grayscale shape, we're getting our knots. And this is a way to isolate where we want to put the knots in our wood material. And because we're using the same shape that we're using to warp our lines to create knots, it sort of all goes together. And if you see, if I click on this here, you see it kind of all flows in a way. So what I can do now is I can take this new blend, put that into the foreground of our final blend, and now you can see this is where mainly our knots are going to be. So now we have this new blend out here, and because we created a new blend, I'm going to add a comment, and I'm going to call it isolate knots. So now that we've isolated our knots, it's time to add another level of detail and add some fine texture to our material. So to get the texture for this new level of detail, I'm going to click on my graph and hit spacebar. I'm going to add a directional noise, and I'll choose directional noise 1. And you can see it's rotated, so I'm just going to go to the angle and move it down to uh, up and down, or negative 90 degrees here. I'm then going to go to the scale parameter and just crank it all the way up to 8, so we get this really fine, noisy detail. And then one more thing that you can do is go to the angle random. So if I bring this up, you start to see it's adding just a bit more variation. So the noise isn't exactly going completely up and down or in one direction. You can sort of vary it to add some organic, natural feel. Something like 0.7 or 0.8 is a pretty good option there for this. So now to make this noise flow with our knots, I'm going to add another warp. I'm going to put the directional noise into the input, and then I'm going to warp this by the same thing that we warped our knots with. So we'll go back again to our blur high quality grayscale, and let's drag that right into the gradient input. And so you can see what's going on here. It looks a bit much because we're getting some stretching. So if I click on the warp here and then bring down the intensity, you can see what's going on. We can just kind of dial in how we want the finer texture to look with this intensity slider. So let's choose something around 0.52 is good. And while we're at it here, I know that I'm going to want to also alter this particular texture later on. So I'm going to drag out a connection and add a levels node. And this levels node will have the same purpose as this levels node down here, but we're not actually going to use it quite yet. So to add this finer texture on top of our material, let's go ahead and get a blend node. Now, one way to add a node after another one is to select the connection. So I'm going to select the connection between our isolate knots blend here and our final blend. This connection here, hit spacebar, and add a blend that way. And what it does is it puts the incoming node into the default input. And, and for a blend node, the default input is the background. And you can tell it's default because it has this small ring inside of the input, this dark gray circle here. So that's in there. And now, not the levels, but let's take another connection out of the warp and put that into the foreground. And so you can see what's going on here. Now it's all just the fine detail. So we need to do either one of two things. We can change the blend mode of this blend node, or we can use this opacity mask input. So let's think about what we want to do here. We want to take this finer detail and we want to apply it to the rest of our material, but we want to choose exactly where we want to put it. Well, like I mentioned before, one way to do that is to use a mask, and we just so happened to create a mask earlier. So if we look at our knots, we've got that histogram scan here that goes into a levels node, and we can take that output and input it into the opacity mask of our blend node. And so now we have a more specific place to put that fine detail. And now this is interesting. So you can see it's very clean cut as to where this fine detail is going. The reason why we added a levels node is because now we can control where this goes. So if I zoom in here, double click the levels node, 
And if I take the bottom left triangle here and bring it up, now we can sort of fade in where that extra detail is coming in. So it's not just where the knots are. Now it's kind of creeping in. You can see it better right about here. Adding in some of that fine detail in here as well. So if you bring it all the way down, it disappears. You can drag it in there. So now that we've made another blend, let's click on it, add a comment, and I'm gonna call this blend fine detail and knots. And while we're at it, let's select these nodes that are adding the fine detail, hit spacebar and frame them up. I'm gonna call it fine detail. So this is what we have so far. And it's looking pretty good, but I wanna add just one more extra small detail to this texture. And let's add a little bit of dirt. So this is pretty easy. If you hit spacebar on the graph and type in dirt, I'm just gonna use a dirt one and I'm gonna keep the scale at one. And you can see what this texture is. It's just a bunch of small specks and you can play with the disorder a little bit, but I think this is just a little bit too much. So to isolate this dirt, I'm gonna add a histogram scan. I use this node quite a lot actually. And let's bring up the position and you can see now we're just getting just a tiny bit of that dirt. Really don't need that much. I'm gonna pick like something very small, 0.2 is good. And now let's add this on by using another blend. So let's make some room. And between our fine detail and knots and our final blend, I'm gonna select that connection, hit spacebar, add that blend. And I'm gonna set this blend to add. So let's take our histogram scan connected to our dirt and let's put that into the foreground of this new blend. So now you can see we're getting these small specks just to add a bit more realism and a bit of extra detail to the wood. So to follow suit, I'm going to select these, add a frame, small dirt, so I'm going to call it, and so that we can identify this blend later on, add a comment and call this add dirt. Let's organize ourselves a little bit here. And now this is what our graph looks like so far. We've got our knots, then we've isolated those knots. We've got some fine detail that we're adding in and now we're just adding in a little bit of dirt. And here's what we have in our 3D view. So this is pretty much the basis of our wood texture. And you can stop here and add some color and change the roughness if you'd like. But what I really wanted to do was add some paneling to this, turn this into a bunch of wood floor panels. So let's make some more room. I'm gonna take all of our nodes over here, drag them over. And to create these tiles, I'm gonna use another tile sampler. So if I double click on the tile sampler, I can change the X and Y amount. We don't need anything in the Y. And we've just got a bunch of X tiles here. I'm gonna go with about 10 of these. 10 looks fine. I'm gonna scroll down and go to the scale property. And if I increase this, let's just make this one. So what that does is just fills up the whole square with tiles evenly. And then what we can do now is take this X size and we can just bring it down and now we can separate them. And I really just want some very thin tiles. So I'm gonna choose just below one. So maybe like 0.98. If I zoom in, you can see we've got those very thin lines now separating these tiles. Okay, so let's see what we're doing here. I'm gonna add another blend between our final blend and our add dirt node. So select that, spacebar, add blend. And what I'm gonna do is actually change this to multiply. In the foreground of this blend, let's put our tile sampler so that we can see what we're doing. So it might be difficult to see, but now we have these very thin lines separating our wood pattern. And it's even more difficult to see in here, but the, yeah, we've got these small tiles. Now, the reason why it's so hard to see that these are tiled is because this pattern continues on through all of our tiles. There's no distinction between where one tile ends and the other begins based on the large overarching shapes that we put on. So what we need to do is we need to displace each tile separately and move these patterns around so it looks like each of these tiles were laid in a random order like we're used to seeing on the floor. So to do that, it's gonna take a couple steps. I'm gonna take this blend that we have. This is the blend that we just created between the final blend and the dirt blend. And I'm gonna make a comment and I'm gonna say, this is the separate tiles blend. That's the step we're doing with this particular blend. First thing we need to do is go to our tile sampler, scroll all the way down to the bottom, 
to where it says color random and just increase that all the way to one. Now you can see that messes us up a little bit, but now you can start to see where these tiles are. And the reason why is because now we're multiplying multiple shades of gray here onto our blend and it doesn't really know what to do with it. So we can actually isolate this into a black and white mask, just like we did when it came to our knots over here. So if we go and we select this connection after the tile sampler, hit spacebar and add another histogram scan. Then all we need to do is increase the position all the way to one and the contrast all the way to one. And now we're back where we started here. And we can see, again, we have these straight line panels all the same. Next, we need to create our directional warp. So I'm creating a directional warp here just by itself. And as the intensity input, I'm going to put in our tile sampler with our different values on it. So this is our directional warp. And what we're going to warp is what's coming out of our add dirt blend. And let's take that and put that into our input of directional warp. I can then change the warp angle holding shift to bring it completely up and down, negative 90. And if I increase this intensity, now you can see our panels are moving at different rates. So I can actually increase this intensity even more. Let's say to something like 100. And now we can change how much each panel is affected. So I'm gonna get rid of this connection between the add dirt and the separate tiles here. And just bring this into the background. And take a look here. Now we've got differences between our paneling here. The lines don't completely match up like they used to. So now we have these separate tiles. But wait, there's more. What if we want some of these tiles to be rough and bumpy and others to be flat? I've seen some tables where some have knots and then some other tiles don't have that roughness pattern on it. So let's add that extra customizable detail now. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a blend between our directional warp and our separate tiles blend. So I'll add a blend here. And on top, I'm just going to find our fine detail and grab this levels here. I can take the output of that levels node, bring it into the foreground of our blend node. And so now you can see we just have our smooth, flat, fine detail here. Now to select what tiles have this fine detail and which have the knots in them and everything else, we need to make another mask. So it's really easy. We're going to go to this tile sampler and drag out another connection and make a histogram scan. So what we can do now is crank the contrast all the way up and then bring up the position. And we can pretty much select which tiles we want to have masked. So I'm going to choose a random amount here. 0.8 is good for me. And let's take this new histogram scan and put this into the opacity of our new blend. And now in our 3D view, you can see that some of our tiles have our knots and some of them don't. Very cool. Now we're looking at this detail here and it's, it's pretty intense. This fine detail is a bit too much. So like before, let's go back and go to our levels node that we created for the fine detail and we can slide up at levels and sort of clamp the low value so it gets a bit lighter. And if we zoom in on here, you can see that that detail is getting a bit less pronounced. If I go all the way up, you see it's getting very smooth. And if I bring it down just a little bit, now we're getting some little detail here. And now we have differentiating panels. So I'm going to do a little bit more organizing here. Let's bring this tile sampler and these histogram scans down. Let's also bring this directional warp down a little bit. And you can see we've got our line of blends here. I like to think of this as adding layer after layer. And we can clean this up by selecting them and choosing this sort of side-by-side -side node icon. And it just makes it so they're all horizontally aligned. And like we've done before, let's right click on the blend and add a comment. And I'm going to call this Shift Tiles. And I'm also going to select all of these nodes down here and frame them up and call this tiles. So we've added a bit more detail to our material and we've added some customization options to this. You can now choose which panels have these knots on them and which one has a smoother surface on it. And just to go over, let's go from the beginning of these blends. We've got to isolate our knots here and we're adding the fine detail above. Then we add the little specks of dirt and then we take our tiles and we shift them and we 
change which tiles are visible and not when it comes to the knots. And then what we're doing with this one is we're taking this histogram scan that we created with our lines and we're multiplying that on so that you can see it a bit better. And that's why we called it separate tiles. Now we have the makings of all of our height information in our material. So this is what our height map is looking like. And this is the effect it's having on our cube here. The next step is to add color or the albedo property to our material. So again, I'm going to make some room by moving over our final blend and all of our output nodes over here. And I'm going to use an unlikely node here to start coloring the material. I'm going to zoom in a little bit in this area. Hit spacebar and type in ambient occlusion. So I'm adding a new ambient occlusion node here. And what I'm going to put into the input of our ambient occlusion is the output from our isolate knots blend. So let me show you what happens here. Let me just left click and then middle mouse click to navigate. Just put it into the front of this ambient occlusion node and now see what it's doing. The ambient occlusion node finds what it figures as height information in all of these shapes and adds shadows to it. So you can see we've got our knots that are higher up on the height scale and the ambient occlusion node is adding these, these sort of fake shadows to the mix. Now this is very useful when it comes to just isolating our knots and to color them specifically. Now we can double click on our ambient occlusion node here and change the height depth. We can make it darker, we can soften it up a little bit. I'm gonna pick a little bit more intense, so 0.24 is good for me. You can adjust the radius if you'd like to. At this scale, it really doesn't do that much. You can sort of see it slightly at the bottom, change the radius of the height, but pretty much that's fine the way it is. I wanna show you what specifically this is doing to our color. If we take our ambient occlusion node, we bring this connection all the way to our base color output here. And I'm just gonna bring it into the input and I can delete this placeholder uniform color, but now you can see what's happening. And that's, that's pretty cool, but there's something a bit off here. You'll notice that we have these lines. They're not quite matching up with our knots. What's going on? Well, remember way back here, we use this directional warp to shift our tiles around. So we need to do the exact same thing to our base color or our albedo. All you really need to do is you can copy paste, control C, control V, or control D to duplicate this directional warp. So now we've got that directional warp again, and I'm just gonna bring our ambient occlusion node back over here. And what we want to warp now with the same intensity input as before, we're just gonna change the input input. Let's put that in. And now you can see it's now shifted just like the previous tiles. So we've got our ambient occlusion, which is getting its information from our isolate knots. We're now directionally warping it by our tile sampler. You can see this connection runs up to here. And now we can replace the connection going into our base color with the output. And you can now see now our ambient occlusion and base color map is matching up with the rest of our tiles. Now this looks pretty cool, but let's start adding some color. I'm gonna head back to where this directional warp is. Now, one of the things I like to do, you see how we have this directional warp and this directional warp, and they do the same thing. One way to sort of keep things organized for me and to help me understand, because there may be other maps that need to follow suit and be warped with the tiles. I'm gonna take this directional warp and this one as well and frame these up. And I'm just gonna call this tile correction. You could call it directional warp or whatever you need to, but yeah, this is tile correction. And so let's actually move this down just a tiny bit. And so for me, this kind of eases my eye a bit when looking at the graph and I can now understand, oh yeah, these, these two are the same and I'm gonna keep organized that way. So after this directional warp, what I wanna do now is invert what I'm getting from it. So, so I can select this connection coming out of my directional warp and add an invert grayscale. So what that does now, if we take a look at our 3D view, only our knots are getting isolated by this white mask that we're creating. And now finally, after our invert grayscale, let's add a gradient map. Now, if you've seen my other Substance Designer tutorials, you know that we use this gradient map to adjust the black to white ratio of what we're getting from our height and recolor it by remapping those colors to this black and white gradient. So if I go to this gradient editor, 
it pops up with a panel like this. And so we can select our gradient, add a key here, and I can you know, make something dark and you know, add maybe something like blue or ugh, and uh, you know, do something ridiculous just so I can show you what this is doing. So you can remap this black to white that you're getting from our height information or from, in this case, our ambient occlusion node that we added in. And you can change the color of, <laughs> wow, that looks crazy, of our, uh, of our material here. Now, instead of doing something you know ridiculous like that, although that could be cool, uh, let's clear all of that and let's use a feature that it has called Pick Gradient. So I've pulled up some reference imagery here and you can see we've got lots of really nice colors in this wooden panel texture. And what we can do is we can say Pick Gradient and then all you have to do is drag across the colors that you like. It's going to populate these keys with the gradient you just created and update our material. Now this is looking quite a bit interesting, but you can see what this has done. This has remapped the values from our height and from our ambient occlusion, and it's applied this gradient to it. And you can adjust the precision. So if I increase the precision, it's going to add more keys and add more detail. I actually find that the less amount of keys you have, the overall better it looks. So we can do this again. Let's pick gradient. Let's try something darker this time. And now you can see you have a completely different wood texture from this. And I can adjust the precision again. And we got something completely different. And now let's do it again. Maybe something a bit more red. <laughs> That's a bit too red. And so you can just play around with this. You can select keys, you can move them around and it's gonna update your graph or you could drag them up to delete them. Or you could select your whole amount of keys and go to these sliders here. This is hue, saturation, value, and alpha or opacity. I'm gonna go to the V for value and you can just darken them here fully. And there you go, you got like a much more dark, rich wood color. Or increase the value, make it pop more. You can bring down that saturation, make it look like it was painted before and it's now fading away. Possibilities are endless here. So I'm just gonna find a gradient that fits for me by picking it from this image. So that's looking pretty good. I'm really happy with how that looks. It's got just enough keys and it's adding this sort of depth into the knotted section of the panels, but also while keeping a bit of information in here. And now, you know, what's interesting is because if I close out of this here and minimize this, because we're coloring this map, which is just isolating the knots and has nothing to do with the tiles, now notice that even though we don't have any knots in these panels, we're still getting a hint of that knotted look from the other type of panel that we made. So we're still getting that wood texture in, but we're, we're not including the more rough wood pattern. So let's select the nodes that we have here. I'm going to include the ambient occlusion stuff and the directional warp all the way to the gradient map and frame this. And to avoid confusion and separation, let's just change this to a green color. And I'm going to call this Albedo. So finally, what I want to do, let's bring our outputs back over here a bit closer. And now we can adjust some things like let's let's look at the roughness. So here's our roughness output. And let's go to this uniform color that's adjusting the roughness. And we'll just you can either slide this slider or slide here and bring it up. And you can make it less shiny, or you can bring it all the way down. Now it's a really it looks as if you put some sort of coat on top of it. And I can hit control shift and right click and you can adjust the light here. And now we can look at it on a flat surface on the top. This is going to be flooring. You kind of want to see it from the top. And really starting to add some realism to it. It's amazing how much the color adds detail in. We can go to the ambient occlusion conversion node that we have. And we can adjust the height depth. We can increase it, make it a bit darker. That's a bit much, so let's decrease it a little more. And so now with the way that we've set up this material, let's go back and we can go to our tiles, for instance. And just with our tile sampler, if we double click that, we can increase the amount of tiles we have or we can decrease them as well. So if I bring down the X amount, now you can see, oh, now we only have six tiles. That looks pretty good. Or we can increase it even more. We got a bunch more tiles here. I think 10 or eight is pretty close to the sweet spot. And then we can go to this histogram scan and if I make a comment on this, let's call this tile selector. Now we can just change the position of this histogram scan and we can choose which tiles are smooth, which ones are rough, and we can go all the way to the right and we can say we just all want all smooth tiles here and that looks pretty good. Or we can go all the way down and make a really rough looking material. 
But for now, I think I'm just going to have this sort of mixture between the two of them. And we can go back even more. So let's, let's go to, say, the knots. And if you don't like this pattern, just go to the tile sampler and scroll down and you could change, let's see, the offset. And this will just completely change how this looks. And you can really dial in what you want. Same thing with the position random. You can see what kind of patterns you can get just by changing one slider. Then going into our anisotropic noise and adding more detail by adding more to the Y amount or taking it down, making it much more of a simpler wood. And everything propagates and you can create whatever kind of wood material you like. And like I always like to do at the end of my tutorials, let's take a look at this on some different shapes. So here's what it looks like on a cylinder. A sphere, we'll do the sphere two tiles. And for the sphere two tiles, I'm gonna to go to the materials menu here in the 3D view and go to edit. And I'm gonna scroll down a little bit and to this global menu here. And I'm gonna bring up the tiling. So I can bring the tiling up to two. And so now you can get a better idea of what this looks like on the sphere. Just a, a way to sort of globally tile your entire graph onto this object, whichever one you're using. And now you can get some, some better detail. And so, yep, framed up the whole graph here. That's what it looks like. And here is our result. As you've seen here, this is one of the many ways to create a wood pattern in Substance Designer. Because you're creating your textures one note at a time, you can lean on Substance Designer's procedural features to go back to the beginning of the graph, tweak something, and really create any kind of wood texture that you'd like to with a fair amount of ease. If you have any questions, please leave a comment down below. And if you like this video, hit the thumbs up. It lets me know that you'd like to see more videos like this one. And if that's true, hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos. Now, there are plenty of tutorials coming soon, and I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.